I step behind the beaded curtain and take a seat on a bench that is absolutely covered in throw pillows. I nestle my way in and I place my hand on the scanner as instructed. The young woman across from me explains how the scanner will translate my energy into visible color. Sure enough, a couple of minutes later, I'm handed a Polaroid picture. There I am, white turtleneck hair pulled back, gold earrings, and I'm surrounded by this orange and yellow haze. The woman leans forward, smiles, and says, this is your aura. Wow, how neat, I say. I've booked this aura photo experience because it's the one thing my sister requested be part of her bachelorette weekend. I'll admit, I'm a little skeptical that this will be much more than a glorified mood ring, but I'm open. I'm open to it. And I'm even a little excited to hear all about my energy. The woman begins to point to different parts of the haze, explaining that the orange represents the energy that I'm putting out into the world around me. Orange, she says, is for creativity and adventure. So far, so good. And the yellow that's above my head represents my consciousness, my current experience, and I'm informed that yellow signifies intelligence and optimism. My aura sounds great. But then I, I notice a green splotch over to the side of the photo. What's that? I ask, pointing to it. Oh, she says, well, it's on your left side, which represents your emotional center. And green is often associated with grief. Ah. I try desperately not to cry. I don't want to cry here in this dimly lit back room of a crystal shop with a stranger in front of me. I don't want to cry at all this weekend, which is supposed to be about joy and celebration. I'm honestly sick of crying and am a little bit surprised that there are even tears left in my body at this point. Grief, I say. That makes sense. This young woman, bless her, just smiles and nods. And she doesn't ask any further. She tucks the photo into a cardboard protective case and hands it to me. She gently says, our auras, they change. You could come back in a week or two months, and it would probably look different. I don't know if that's a sales pitch, giving me reason to come back and pay for another photo, or if it's a kind reminder that the grief won't be this strong forever. I say thank you and make my way back to my mom and my sister and her friends. I put a smile on my face and proclaim I have an intelligent aura. Brushing off the fact that, in the words of Paul, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. 
I have heard a thousand variations on that verse, on the sentiment behind it. I feel empty. I'm in so much pain. I don't know what to do. I'm lost. Great sorrow is a part of life, and I don't know a single person who hasn't wrestled with it in some way. So perhaps it shouldn't come as a surprise that Paul engaged in this wrestling of the soul, that Paul, the prolific writer who has an argument for just about everything, can also feel lost and confused. Paul is wrestling with something in this passage from Romans something that pains him to his core. But we can't be sure exactly what it is that pains him. It is an anti-Jewish reading and an incorrect reading to assume that Paul is pained due to a belief that the Jewish people are wrong or unredeemable. Paul writes at length about this in Romans. And he comes to a decisive conclusion. Paul says that God's love and grace is for everyone. He says that the kingdom of God includes the Jewish and the Gentile people. Paul even names the many treasures that God has entrusted specifically to the Jewish community. However, Paul is wrestling with something about this relationship between the Jewish community and the Gentile community. Paul straddles these two worlds. He is ethnically Jewish. He was born and raised within Judaism. He studied it at length, and presumably he has friends and family who continue to worship in that tradition. And Paul has become a primary leader of the early Gentile Christian movement. He plants churches and trains disciples and nurtures the very beginnings of what will become Christianity. So perhaps Paul is wrestling with the relationship between these two worlds and how he must stand in the bridge at times. How he loves people in both spaces, how he maybe feels both insider and outsider at the same time. How many of us can relate in our own way? How many of us straddle different communities, maybe even different belief systems? How many of us have tried to knit together the community in which we are raised and the community in which we now find ourselves? That can be painful sometimes. Or perhaps Paul is wrestling with parts of himself. Paul is not a perfect man. Before he was Paul, he was Saul a radical persecutor of the earliest Christ followers. He sought their death. Perhaps he is pained by his past and trying to make sense of how that fits with who he is now. How many of us have been there wrestling with what we have done? How many of us have tried to make sense of our past in light of our present? That can be painful, too. We can't know exactly what it is that pains Paul, but we can know that he is wrestling. 
that something is causing him anguish and he does not have the answer for it. Yet in his unknowing, he offers us a profound truth. For you see, this section of Romans, in which Paul confesses the deep pain of his heart, it comes right after one of the most powerful verses in all of his letters. Maybe you're familiar. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. In fact, the first verse of today's passage in chapter 9 might very well be referring not to what comes after in verse 2, but to what comes right before in chapter 8. That Paul is saying, I am speaking the truth that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even my own or our own pain. Not even our own wrestling, not even our own uncertainty. In doing this, Paul reminds us we don't have to fix it or figure it out or do it on our own. We can take our burden off and we can lay it down. The story of Jacob wrestling with the angel is one of my favorite scriptures. Because it reminds me that there is nothing wrong with wrestling with God. There's nothing abnormal about questioning or wrestling within our own soul. It reminds me that there are so many within our faith that have struggled mightily. And it's interesting, the text from Genesis says that Jacob stands on the riverbank and that sometime in the darkness of the night he begins to wrestle with someone. And of course, the common interpretation, the interpretation that I often use, is that Jacob is wrestling with the divine, with an angel. But that's not the only interpretation. Some say that Jacob initially is wrestling with another human, maybe even his brother Esau. Some say that the river Jabbok was home to a demon and that Jacob is wrestling with a dark force. Some even say that Jacob is wrestling with himself and that the angel shows up to pull him out of it, to save him. This story both normalizes wrestling in our souls, wrestling with God, and reminds us that we wrestle with God. We wrestle with God on our side, whether or not we realize it. If you are or have ever been in a place of wrestling, in a place where sorrow and anguish are in your heart, I do not have magic words to make it better. I wish that I did. But I can tell you that you are in very good company. You are in the company of basically every person I've ever known. You are in the company of great figures in our faith. And I can tell you that it will change. If you come back in a couple of weeks, or a couple of months, or maybe a couple of years, it will look different. That's not a sales pitch. 
And I can offer you the challenge of our faith, which puts side by side the truth that there is great sorrow and the truth that nothing can separate us from the love of God. The challenge of our faith, which is to hold together these two truths, even though they can feel like opposing sides of a magnet, to hold together the sorrow and the love, the storm and the rainbow, the cross and the resurrection. Thank you.